I'm going okay. to read from Sorcerer's Stone, and I'm going to read... Um, now, I absolutely loved writing this passage, and in fact, I started writing this sitting under a tree <laughs> in, a, in, the, in a park, uh, which is appropriate, and you will understand why it's appropriate when I've read a little more. Okay. The last shop was narrow and shabby. Peeling gold letters over the door read, Ollivanders, makers of fine wands since 382 BC. A single wand lay on a faded purple cushion in the dusty window. A tinkling bell rang somewhere in the depths of the shop as they stepped inside. It was a tiny place except for a single spindly chair that Hagrid sat on to wait. Harry felt strangely as though he had entered a very strict library. He swallowed a lot of new questions that had just occurred to him and looked instead at the thousands of narrow boxes piled neatly right up to the ceiling. For some reason, the back of his neck prickled. The very dust and silence in here seemed to tingle with some secret magic. Good afternoon, said a soft voice. Harry jumped. Hagrid must have jumped too because there was a loud crunching noise and he got quickly off the spindly chair. An old man was standing before them, his wide, pale eyes shining like moons through the gloom of the shop. Hello, said Harry awkwardly. Ah, yes, said the man. Yes, yes, I thought I'd be seeing you soon. Harry Potter. It wasn't a question. You have your mother's eyes. It seems only yesterday she was in here herself, buying her first wand. Ten and a quarter inches long, swishy, made of willow. Nice wand for charm work. Mr. Ollivander moved closer to Harry. Harry wished he would blink. Those silvery eyes were a bit creepy. Your father, on the other hand, favoured a mahogany wand. Eleven inches, pliable, a little more power, and excellent for transfiguration. Well, I say your father favoured it. It's really the wand that chooses the wizard, of course. Mr. Ollivander had come so close that he and Harry were almost nose to nose. Harry could see himself reflected in those misty eyes. And that's where... Mr. Ollivander touched the lightning scar on Harry's forehead with a long white finger. I'm sorry to say I sold the wand that did it, he said softly. Thirteen and a half inches. You. Powerful wand, very powerful, and in the wrong hands. Well, if I'd known what that wand was going out into the world to do... He shook his head and then, to Harry's relief, spotted Hagrid. Rubeus, Rubeus Hagrid, how nice to see you again. Oak, 16 inches, rather bendy, wasn't it? It was, sir, yes, said Hagrid. Good wand, that one. But I suppose they snapped it in half when you got expelled, said Mr. Ollivander, suddenly stern. Er, uh, yes, they did, yes, said Hagrid, shuffling his feet. I've still got the pieces, though. He added brightly, but you don't use them, said Mr. Ollivander sharply. Oh, no, sir, said Hagrid. Harry noticed he gripped his pink umbrella very tightly as he spoke. Hmm, said Mr. Ollivander, giving Hagrid a piercing look. Well, now, Mr. Potter, let me see. He pulled a long tape measure with silver markings out of his pocket. Which is your wand hand? Uh, well, I'm right-handed, said Harry. Hold out your arm, that's it. He measured Harry from shoulder to finger, then wrist to elbow, shoulder to floor, knee to armpit, and round his head. As he measured, he said, Every Ollivander wand has a core of a powerful magical substance, Mr. Potter. We use unicorn hairs, phoenix tail feathers, and the heartstrings of dragons. No two Ollivander wands are the same, just as no two unicorns, dragons, or phoenixes are quite the same. And, of course... You will never get such good results with another wizard's wand. Harry suddenly realised that the tape measure, which was measuring between his nostrils, was doing this on its own. Mr Ollivander was flitting around the shelves, taking down boxes. That will do, he said, and the tape measure crumpled into a heap on the floor. Right then, Mr Potter, try this one. Beechwood and dragon heart string, nine inches, nice and flexible. Just take it and give it a wave. Harry took the wand and, feeling foolish, waved it around a bit, but Mr. Ollivander snatched it out of his hand almost at once. Maple and phoenix feather, seven inches, quite whippy. Try? Harry tried, 
but he had hardly raised the wand when it too was snatched back by Mr. Ollivander. No, no, here, ebony and unicorn hair, eight and a half inches, springy. Go on, go on, try it out. Harry tried, and tried. He had no idea what Mr. Ollivander was waiting for. The pile of tried wands was moving higher and higher on the spindly chair, but the more wands Mr. Ollivander pulled from the shelves, the happier he seemed to become. Tricky customer, eh? Not to worry, we'll find the perfect match here somewhere. I wonder now, yes, why not? Unusual combination. Holly and Phoenix feather, 11 inches, nice and supple. Harry took the wand. He felt a sudden warmth in his fingers. He raised the wand above his head, brought it swishing down through the dusty air, and a stream of red and gold sparks shot from the end like a firework, throwing dancing spots of light onto the walls. Hagrid whooped and clapped, and Mr. Ollivander cried, Oh, bravo! Yes, indeed! Oh, very good! Well, well, well! How curious! How very curious! He put Harry's wand back into its box and wrapped it in brown paper, still muttering, Curious! Curious! Sorry, said Harry, but what's curious? Mr. Ollivander fixed Harry with his pale stare. I remember every wand I've ever sold, Mr. Potter. Every single wand. It so happens that the phoenix whose tail feather is in your wand gave another feather. Just one other. It is very curious. Yes. Thirteen and a half inches, you. Curious indeed how these things happen. The wand chooses the wizard, remember. I think we must expect great things from you, Mr. Potter. After all, he who must not be named did great things. Terrible, yes, but great. Harry shivered. He wasn't sure he liked Mr. Ollivander too much. He paid seven gold galleons for his wand, and Mr. Ollivander bowed them from his shop. The late afternoon sun hung low in the sky as Harry and Hagrid made their way back down Diagon Alley, back through the wall, back through the leaky cauldron, now empty. Harry didn't speak at all as they walked out down the road. He didn't even notice how much people were gawking at them on the, on the underground, laden as they were with all their funny-shaped packages, with the snowy owl asleep in its cage on Harry's lap. Up another escalator, out into Paddington Station, Harry only realised where they were when Hagrid tapped him on the shoulder. Got time for a bite to eat before your train leaves, he said. He bought Harry a hamburger, and they sat down on plastic seats to eat them. Harry kept looking around. Everything looked so strange somehow. You're all right, Harry. You're very quiet, said Hagrid. Harry wasn't sure he could explain. He'd just had the best birthday of his life, and yet he chewed his hamburger trying to find the words. Everyone thinks I'm special, he said at last. All those people in the leaky cauldron, Professor Quirrell, Mr. Ollivander. But I don't know anything about magic at all. How can they expect great things? I'm famous and I can't even remember what I'm famous for. I don't know what happened when Vol... Sorry. I mean the night my parents died. Hagrid leaned across the table. Behind the wild beard and eyebrows, he wore a very kind smile. Don't you worry, Harry. You'll learn fast enough. Everyone starts at the beginning at Hogwarts. You'll be just fine. Just be yourself. I know it's hard. You've been singled out and that's always hard. But you'll have a great time at Hogwarts. I did. Still do, as a matter of fact. Hagrid helped Harry onto the train that would take him back to the Dursleys, then handed him an envelope. Your ticket for Hogwarts, he said. First of September, King's Cross. It's all on your ticket. Any problems with the Dursleys, send me a letter with your owl. She'll know where to find me. See you soon, Harry. The train pulled out of the station. Harry wanted to watch Hagrid until he was out of sight. He rose in his seat and pressed his nose against the window, but he blinked, and Hagrid had gone.